one. Excellent. So I am uh, I'm live. I'm, I'm with uh, Emin today. Emin, how are you? Very good. Thank you very much for having me. Excellent. So as I was saying, I'm, I'm very, very excited, uh, a bit nervous, not going to lie, because I've been following you on Twitter and your work uh, for, for quite some time. And, you know, just as a level set, I usually start with like, where did we meet? So I guess I just answered that question, which is right now, <laughs> we haven't really met. But like I said, I've been aware of your work and, and uh, a big fan of, you know, a lot of the kind of the, you know, the intellectual curiosity and, and the challenging of like Bitcoin, I think um, has you've helped me shape a lot of my thoughts around it as well. So with that said, you know, my, um, I, I really, I always say like, whether it's Avalanche or Bitcoin or anything, it's really just, it comes down to ones and zeros fundamentally, right? So these things that we're working on, that we're building are a function of us, <laughs> of our stories and what makes us us. And so one of the things I find very interesting is, is, is the stories of the people behind it. So I mean, you know, at, to get this started off, I wanted to, you know, kind of get your worldview in terms of uh, where you're coming from. Some people start with like great grandparents, some people start with their first job, you know, I don't know where your story begins, but really interested in, in, in not your 30 second uh, story, but kind of like, yeah, what your story is. Um, my personal life story is uh, fairly straightforward. I was born in Istanbul. And uh, grew up there. And uh, growing up um, as a, as a tech tech oriented kid in a country where everything is done not to hundred percent level uh, at the time, you know, Turkish construction, Turkish engineering was always to a to an expedient level as opposed mm. to a perfection level. Mm. Um, like the doors would never close with that satisfying click. The windows were not quite square. Buildings, are, you know, they cut corners back then. Um, that was the state of affairs in a developing country um, back when I was growing up. And that kind of uh, um, sort of instilled in me a sense of building perfect things. And I saw computers and I felt, oh, this is wonderful. These things create a universe internally that can be absolutely perfect, where you can get every single detail right. So uh, one of the driving things about me is that I love to build systems that, are, that have a life of their own, that have a... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. You know, that have their own arc, uh, that, that self-organize, self-administer, self-manage, systems with a notion of, of self, what we call self-star, self-preservation. Uh, self and, um, uh, and also a sense of uh, systems that, that actually provide strong guarantees and stand behind them. So mm. that's, that's sort of what got me started. I wanted to go into AI and uh, I, got to, I got a very nice scholarship from Princeton University. And, um, uh, and I was like, sure, I'd be a fool not to take this. Mm. I go there and uh, I looked around. I took some AI class. I took some psychology classes. I took some AI classes. And I thought, hey, this is, it's going to take a few decades for AI to come to its own. And meanwhile, we just don't know how to build things that work. We don't know how to build computer systems that stay up. You would go into a bank and they'd say, come back tomorrow. Our systems are locked up. Or you'd go into the airport and they would say, well, we can't, you know, we have to process everything manually. We cannot process anything automatically today. And it seemed, and you know, back then blue, blue screen of death was a very big thing. I think uh, a generation of people knows all about BSOD, BSOD, which is the blue screen of death. And, um, you know, younger, Do you remember your first computer, by the way? <laughs> my, my first, say again, my computer? First, uh, my first computer also had a blue screen. It was a Commodore 64. Wow. Okay. Commodore 64. It was absolutely the best, best starter machine ever, ever built. Um, so anyway, so I was like, look, we got to build things that stay up. We can't mm. have a stop that just crashes all the time. So, uh, so that's what got me going. I worked on operating systems, the most complicated things one could imagine building at the time. And, um, and then um, I started as a young professor at Cornell University. Mm -hmm. at the time when peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file sharing was big. When and, was this? Uh, well, this is 2001. Mm. And um, nearly 20 years ago. It was, yeah, it was, it was 20, exactly 20 years ago to, to the day, actually. Interesting. And, uh, and uh, a big problem in these systems is, you know, everybody wants resources. I want to download stuff. So that's the main thing I want to do. The last thing I want is upload stuff, right? It was, it's very asymmetric. I remember that. So, yeah. uh, so, so well, how do you get people to, to, I mean, this is a common problem in societies. How do you get people to contribute as opposed to just take things? So the simplest way I could imagine doing this, and I was mm. apparently the first person to suggest this, was 
let's invent some magic internet money that you get for free just by being a person on the internet. You, you have to just, you have to prove something to get your initial purse. And then uh, once you get your money, then you can use it to download files or you can use it to, uh, or you can, you can collect it by uh, uploading files. So if you just download, you'll run out of money and at some point you'll have to go and, and do some good for society. That was my idea. And uh, to invent that, uh, that, uh, that magic money, uh, my suggestion was to use proof of work and minting via proof of work. So I built this system called Karma uh, with, two, with uh, two or three uh, brilliant uh, students who helped me back then. And, uh, and the Karma system uh, was, I think, the very first implementation of a proof of work uh, based minting scheme. So uh, way long time ago, six years before Satoshi came along. Now, to be fair, Satoshi did something fundamentally different in addition to what I was doing. So he's got his, his brilliant insight was to change the consensus protocol to use the same uh, proof of work mechanism. So he had one, one leg up on me on that front and he's brilliant. Uh, it's a big, big step up. But uh, Karma also was a good idea. It's very well cited today. Uh, but after Karma, what happened was um, I have these mentors that I talk to, older professors. Mm -hmm. said, Look, this is really cool stuff. It's really exciting. It's really interesting technically, but you'll never get funding for this. It just, it's, it's just not going to go anywhere. So for a young assistant professor, this is a dead end. Why? Because it's right after 9-11. Mm -hmm. Everyone's worried about terrorist financing. And here you are talking about a virtual internet currency. This is just not going to go well for you. And... Um, <laughs> and so he abandoned the idea and yeah. uh, Satoshi came along, as I said, with a huge leg up uh -huh. and his timing was impeccable. He came after 2008 when everybody was worried about the state of the economy mm -hmm. and the rest is history. So then I started looking at what he did. Um, I found some issues with uh, Bitcoin. Uh, I improved Bitcoin security with this notion of covenants and vaults. I worked on, uh, on Ethereum. I identified the problems in the DAO. Before it went down, I helped them recover and sort of, uh, I don't know, I, I was a voice in that, in steering Ethereum, uh, if you will, in, in certain directions. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I invented some cool things like the fastest layer two on top of Bitcoin and so on. So that's, I played a role in a bunch of things. I had a nice fun life uh, so far and uh, there is much more fun to be had up ahead, actually, turns out. Um, it's for the last two years, I've been working on the Avalanche system where I think uh, we have the world's biggest breakthrough in, in uh, distributed systems uh, in, in a long, long time. It's the, it's the best uh, consensus protocol ever devised. It's a huge step up. It's definitely the biggest thing that happened ever since the, the, the Satoshi white paper. Okay, so uh, by the way, I, I, I do want it. I, I did really want to go into kind of like the football field analogy and the red and the blue that, that you shared in the past, just because I thought it was so, so interesting. Um, but before we do, in terms of your story, in terms of your story, so is it fair to say you were a, like a bit nerdy, maybe a bit like very technical? Were you building yeah. things? Were you a bit more entrepreneurial, a combination of things? Like what oh, was your, uh, just curious. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I think I hide it well in polite society. I think normal people can't really tell, but I'm supremely nerdy. Ask me anything about the 6502 instruction set or ask me anything about the VAX instruction set. Ask me anything about weird operating system tricks. Mm. So, uh, you know, or, uh, or anything about consensus protocols. So uh, I'm, I'm, so I'm a supremely nerdy pe person. I'm uh, an engineer at heart and I'm mm. uh, uh, I'm the kind of engineer who loves to provide strong guarantees that they can stand behind. That can, you know, this will happen, and I, I, I want to sleep well knowing that the system built will, will guarantee that, uh, that premise or whatever we say. And, and I mean, another question is, as you know, I mean, some people will say, oh, Bitcoin's a crypto asset. It's a this, it's a that. But I mean, it's pretty clear that, you know, Bitcoin, right, that, that the founders were probably implying that they wanted to reinvent money. Um, curious, what was before even learning about Bitcoin and, and coming into this space, what was your relationship with money? Was it one that you just didn't care like most people? Was it something that you thought deeply about or somewhere in between? Oh, it's definitely not something I thought deeply about. I've always been fascinated by finance. So mm. I, I like systems, as I said, that are self-organizing, that have a life mm. of their own. And uh, the internet is one such beast, right? It has its own structure, etc. So I was drawn to networking and I was also drawn to the finance system. And uh, 
it's also an arcane area. It's not that many people understand how it operates internally, what the systems are powering behind it. So um, my relationship to finance was I wanted to understand financial instruments. I studied on my own for a long time. But uh, as for making money, that's not, that was never a motivator for me. It never, it still is not. I'm here to really change the world. I'm not here to, you know, making money it just doesn't matter. I was super happy being a, a, a poorly paid uh, a tenured professor uh, in, in, at, at Ivy League's university. And, um, and that's, that's fine. And, uh, you know, and the next thing for me to do is, is show the world how blockchains can be very, very fast and how they can actually transform society. That's what and what was that insight? You know, and again, I, I'd heard some of it, but you, you mentioned how, you know, Satoshi was, I think in like 40 or 50 years, there had never been, you know, uh, like a consensus, uh, you know, a, a breakthrough. And it was really the first of its kind. Yes. Um, but then you said that really what his marriage or his insight was is that he married, um, you know, two, two ideas, right? Of like the minting process along with this consensus alg algorithm, uh, a proof of work rather. And yeah. so, um, so I guess maybe just to kind of go into more of the technical side of things, you know, I'm really excited about that in terms of what, so how does one go, okay, this is what it is, smarter people, you know, I mean, it doesn't scale perhaps to maybe it, it fits a certain need and, and it proves a certain point, but it doesn't, um, you know, if, if we're thinking about decentralizing everything, it doesn't maybe fit the bill. And, and how, how do you, how, what's your thought process and how does one even go about, you know, trying to solve that problem? Sure. Um, let me give you the, the brief history of my mm. distributed systems. It's very easy. It's a very, Please. it's not like, it's not like a biology, which goes back, you know, <laughs> years. This is a field that's been around for only 45 years. Mm. Initially, um, uh, all academics, every single person who, mm. uh, who has a PhD has a certain mindset uh, that was taught to them starting in the late seventies, all throughout uh, the early 2000s. And that mindset and that framework is called classical consensus protocols. The people who came up with them are uh, Leslie Lamport, Barbara Liskov, and uh, people in that lineage. And uh, Lamport and Liskov both have Turing Awards, the biggest award given to any computer scientist and very well-deserved ones, of course. They came up with a whole family of protocols that uh, are very well known and uh, that academics are very fond of. And then Satoshi came in in 2009 and he said look all this stuff that you guys worked on it's all trying to replicate a small scale closed parliament well a parliament where you know people might misbehave true but it's kind of like a closed small parliament and what we need is an entirely different approach and uh, and i'm going to redefine the problem a little bit i'm going to change it from the way academics think about it i'm going to make it probabilistic so uh, he added that little twist and, he, and if it turns out that something that happens with 99.9999999% probability is exactly the same as something that happens with 100% probability. Mm. Why? Because our computational devices are already imperfect. There are already mm. imperfections in the system. Um, but from a theoretical perspective, for academics, this is a big step. So mm. your typical theoretician um, wants to have 100% probability and, um, and uh, just, you know, they couldn't really understand that going to this like, you know, 100 minus epsilon was <laughs> just as good. And that's, that was the initial Satoshi insight. Mm. And, and once he had that insight, he was able to combine proof of work with the minting uh, and uh, the consensus process with the coin generation process. And suddenly he had this enormous breakthrough. And what is that? It's an open system. It's not like a closed parliament. You and I could join the, uh, the Bitcoin miners, uh, you know, whatever, the, the, the set of people who are mining Bitcoin and start participating today. It would be very expensive. You and I couldn't actually join. You know, you and I don't have enough electricity. We don't have enough mining rigs. Today, that's become a very big, big, highly centralized operation. But, it, you know, at least in the early days, we could do that. So, um, so he came up with an algorithm that's open to all and, um, and works really well. The problem with that algorithm is it doesn't scale well. Mm. It doesn't scale well in the number of participants and it doesn't scale well in the amounts of uh, transactions processed per second. It certainly doesn't scale well in transaction latency. If what you want to do is use Bitcoin as a settlement layer or store of value, it's perfect. And uh, if that's what you want to go for, then, then it's golden. That, that's perfect. It's internet gold, right? It's, it's the electronic version of 
of gold. And so Bitcoin is perfect for what it wants to be today. So, uh, um, so that's the Bitcoin uh, approach. That's how I think of Bitcoin. But if you want to have a medium of exchange, or if you want to build a system on which other people can generate other digital assets, then you have to think more broadly. Then you have to come up with better algorithms that scale well. So suppose we are going to put every stock certificate on the internet. Suppose we're going to put every derivative, every option, every future, every single piece of corporate debt on the internet. And we're going to put all value on the internet in blockchain form. Well, then you need a different infrastructure than what we've got. Uh, Bitcoin is not going to cut it for you. Bitcoin is playing a game where it's trying to be electronic gold. And mm. it's playing that game actually pretty, pretty well, as if I look around today. And it's good for what it does. Mm. But that is no longer the game I want to play. I, I don't think that, I mean, there are a lot of competitors. Everybody wants to be, like, what is Litecoin? It's just, a, it's a me too coin. It's just Bitcoin like copied over. Three, three um, parameters, I think, were three changed. Three parameters were changed and now you've got a different coin, right? Um, <laughs> so and by the way, I mean, I had a front row seat for Ethereum because I live in Toronto, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm, I did the whole thing in India and I'm still part of that, but I mean, I'm originally from Canada. And so, so the Turing completeness and that, so I'm really interested in how you weave into Ethereum and then finally go into Avalanche because- uh, I see. So Ethereum is a very different beast, and uh, it's a system I happen to love to bits. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a computational platform, right? mm. it's very general, but it's, it also is not created from the ground up for people to create assets. It doesn't have a concept of an asset. The only native asset on Ethereum is ETH. There is no other thing. You create these ERC-20s, but as far as the miners are concerned, the ERC-20 coins are just code. The system doesn't know the value it's holding. Those things are not assets visible. The system to the doesn't world. know the value it's holding. Okay, continue. I, I, okay, I, okay, so continue. Let's, let's pause that. Let's. Let, it has yeah, that. please. No, oh, that has a lot of implications. For example, suppose we place uh, Toronto real estate mm -hmm. on the Ethereum blockchain as an ERC yeah. twenty. Yeah. Well, the miners will just mine those transactions, not knowing that they're handling something special. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Right? They're just executing code, and that code happens to do some real estate transaction, and they end up charging per instruction, but they're not doing anything special for that asset, mm. nor are they able to extract value from the transactions they're facilitating. Mm. So Ethereum is like a, it's like a sandbox. It's, a, a, you know, accessible to all. It's very nice, very uniform, but the coupling between the layers is not very good. So the underlying layers do not know about the things implemented at the layer on top. And that means that, um, that miners, for example, cannot provide value added services for special classes of assets. So for real estate, I think you want slightly different handling. You don't want that to be stuck between or behind Uniswap interactions. I don't know. Uh, you don't want somebody's, uh, you know, whatever it is that they might be doing to, um, to come ahead of them. You want uh, the record to be, uh, stored and archived in a manner that's different from what you would do for a typical ERC-20 transaction. There's a whole lot of things you might want to do for different asset classes. Hmm. Um, if, if the asset classes are not visible to the system, you're not going to be able to get there. Um, so that's one of the many differences between us and Ethereum. Um, but, uh, but so the main thing, maybe I should just jump on to Avalanche. Yeah. Avalanche was designed from the ground up. Uh, with a vision towards facilitating people to mm -hmm. convert their assets into digital blockchain form. That's our goal. We want to be the internet of value. So if you have something that's valuable and you want to fractionalize it, you want to distribute it, you want to sell it across the globe, then the, the Avalanche platform ought to be for you. And to facilitate that, it has a couple of unique features. It has a, a, break, a, a groundbreaking new consensus protocol. That mm. is highly scalable. It has a very flexible foundation that makes explicit to every layer what the assets are. It allows the assets to be coded in any language and, and allows the assets to use any virtual machine that is, that is a good fit for that asset. And uh, it allows the asset creator to determine the, uh, the network participants that actually house and implement that asset. So that's... Uh, that's, uh, those are the two big things. And the third one, of course, is governance. Avalanche um, is, uh, is a platform where certain parameters can be changed with, uh, with the, uh, the help of, uh, of uh, the people um, 
who are holding the tokens. So key parameters in many blockchains are just fixed. So as you know, Bitcoin's minting schedule is fixed for all time. Um, and uh, sometimes, you know, Satoshi got it right, but sometimes he didn't get it right. Sometimes he over mints and uh, the coin prices go down. Um, you know, in Bitcoin, it's kind of, it's been kind of okay. But if you look at Zcash, for example, they certainly over mint. If you look at Ethereum, Ethereum was over minting for a long time. Um, so, uh, and the price was going down a lot. So, um, so you can't just bake these things into uh, your base layer and then have them be okay for like the next 50 years. It's just, nobody can predict economics for, you know, a year out, let alone 50 years out. So in Avalanche, uh, these key parameters, the economic parameters are subject to governance by, uh, by coin holder vote. And so that allows people to, uh, to be able to change with changing external circumstances. And this is all thanks to a different type of consensus algorithm? Is that like you're so, or like I mean, what was kind of the fundamental, I don't know, like a breakthrough in terms of that, that enabled all of these functionalities to happen? Well, there are a couple of things. So um, the, the, there is a fundamental breakthrough in the consensus algorithm that gives us our performance properties. And then uh, the uh, other things I mentioned are additional different steps that we took to change the model. So everybody mm -hmm. else in this game has a one coin, one virtual machine, one network kind of a yes. game. Yeah. So BTC is the coin, the Bitcoin virtual machine is what they've got. And then there's the Bitcoin network. And that's all that net, that network. But Cosmos, is, we can show you a quick story. I also know Ethan and these guys from the beginning. So I'm just curious, can you just to help uh, other people understand too, but Cosmos is not like that though, right? Well, so there are three coins that are not like that. So Cosmos, Avalanche and Polkadot have a yeah. vision where we have, uh, um, where we have different, uh, so let's see. Uh, Cosmos has this notion of zones, which are essentially different uh, networks. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Polkadot has this, this notion of parachains, which is a similar yep. notion as well. Um, the parachain idea is currently not implemented. And uh, in Avalanche, we have this notion of subnetworks. So uh, we are the ones that are most flexible in the sense that we support multiple virtual machines and multiple networks. Got Our it. Goal okay. Is that there will be many, many, many thousands of different coins that people build on top of Avalanche. That's the end game. And once we get to that level, what we can do is we can support coins for different specific purposes with different legal jurisdictions uh, behind them. And we can, we can help uh, people issue assets in a legally compliant manner where they can have some say over the, uh, the, uh, the, the disposition of the asset over its full lifetime. So what that means is, you know, take some company, take a company that wants to uh, use a blockchain. Okay, so what is what are the impediments? Number one impediment is blockchains are slow. And if they go on Ethereum, they're going to be, it's going to be so slow and so expensive that their asset, you know, whether or not they can get to their asset is unknown, right? So if it's happening on a day with like a lot of price action and everybody wants to use Uniswap, you won't be able to interact with your ERC-20. It's just, it's just not, it's going to cost much, too much. So imagine controlling your house, uh, an IoT device, over the Ethereum blockchain. So one day you pay like five bucks, another day you pay $150. So that's a no-go. It's like a company will never use that chain because of the unpredictability of the underlying performance characteristics of the chain. That's one problem. Mm -hmm. Second problem, take a company that has some assets, real estate in Toronto we, we picked on. So let's pick that. And now you want to fractionalize it and you want to sell it. You know, if, if you try to sell your apartment in Toronto, you know how hard that is, right? And, uh, and if I'm buying your apartment, I have to go look, blah, 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 do all sorts of crazy things. But if you fractionalize and I want to make a bet on Toronto going big, which I actually want to, Toronto is going to be a great place. And I want to buy, you know, some fractionalized real estate in, in, uh, in Toronto, in Canada. So um, I want to invest. But, uh, but you have to be very careful about what can happen to that asset over its lifetime. You want to be very careful about how it behaves. You know, so if I have multiple shares of your apartment, they might, I'm, I should be able to merge them. Uh, if uh, there are new laws, you should be able to change your contract to accommodate. And uh, if there is uh, some kind of a restriction on who can and cannot hold your, your, uh, your asset, you need to be able to, to somehow uh, make the appropriate modifications to the system that's live. The only way you can do this 
is by having control over the virtual machine and the network that implements this asset. So for all these reasons, it makes sense to create what we call sub-networks with their own virtual machines and their own net assets. And Avalanche facilitates this exact thing. So if there are any um, sort of CEOs, CIOs, CTOs listening to me at Fortune 500 companies, and I know I, I, I'm, I've spoken to quite a few, chances are about 490 of these companies in the, in the top 500 have already played with private permission blockchains. And they've noticed that these are dead ends. These are technologically bad ideas. Nobody ever uses them. Every single proof of concept has been abandoned. Every single one without exception. And, uh, and the reason for this is, the reasons there are many and I can get into them. But what Avalanche does is it provides to people a continuum between private permission blockchains and public blockchains. So if I create a subnet, that's just, you know, whatever, 25 friends of mine or 25 people in a consortium, I have a private permission blockchain. If I use the default subnet, I have a public blockchain. I'm using the Avalanche blockchain. But I can do something in the middle. I can say something like, hey, I'm creating a new asset. And, um, and uh, to participate in this network, you have to have more resources. I'm going to have far bigger smart contracts. It's a complicated asset. It would never work on Ethereum. It would cost too much. Mm. But on this network, I have different nodes. Mm. You can do this in Avalanche. And you couldn't do this on Ethereum. It would, you'd have to argue with the entire community. You'd have to cut people out and so on. Um, or another thing you can do, you can say, look, everybody who, needs to, who wants to join my network agrees to abide by Canadian law because this asset is, for, is, is subject to Canadian laws. And you can do this on Avalanche. You could not do it anywhere else. So if there's any, uh, any enterprise people listening to this, well, this is the one chain where you can have full legal control down to the node level. And this is not possible on any other chain that I know of. Um, if you want to have a chain that holds data subject to GDPR, you know, the, the European uh, privacy laws, well, you can build a, sub a subnet that's where the participants are subject to GDPR. Um, and so on. I can go on like Okay, this. okay. I, I'm following the... Uh, I mean, a couple of things I want to quickly mention. Uh, there is a company, by the way, by the name of Token Funder in Toronto that has been given the green light by the Ontario Securities Commission to do exactly the real estate thing. They're using, I think, Ethereum right now, but I'm definitely going to uh, send this interview along to Alan because uh, because I'm sure he'll he'll find it interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I was going to ask you, do you, do you, would you mind do you mind talking a little bit about that 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 football analogy we kind of touched, or do you do would you rather not? I mean, you I know you've already oh, talked I'm, about in other interviews, so people I can know, point people there. I'm super happy. But I just thought it was super cool because, like, to me, it's uh, like I said, I'm very critical of Ethereum and have been for a long time, and I always felt like. There were a lot of things that just didn't make, like I'm being an engineer myself. I, I mean, I'm not the smartest engineer, but I, it, there are a lot of things that didn't make sense, right? And 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 I, I know I, for what it's worth, I do, and, I, and I've heard you talk about Bitcoin maximalists, but I, I do consider myself a Bitcoin maximalist mainly because it's just too hard not being that, meaning you, you get scammed, there's so many things coming. So it's almost easier to take a stance and then it's like, okay, prove me why, you know, what's better here on the other side. So sure. I'm really fascinated by lightning because you talked about speed a lot. Um, you, I'm also fascinated by um, RSK, which is like second layer on top of Bitcoin and yeah. just solving for a lot of these problems using second layer. When I look at the computers and how my video games and stuff work, it echoes that like it to me to me it, it kind of echoes it, it kind of makes sense so i'm curious though like it, 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 is it is that and can, you did talk about little semi networks like it, yeah, are we talking like liquid now is that kind of what you're referring to when you say groups of 25 friends like do i need to have, have hardware on the avalanche chain but what are what are kind of i guess yeah so so my, my question would be is is someone who's looking to build these types of applications and by the way, I, I, <laughs> I'm probably one of them, right? Because I've been building, you know, centralized exchanges for almost 10 years. And I see both the benefits and all the downsides of that. And so I'm, I'd be uh, lying if I said I, I I'm not actively thinking about things like that, right? But, 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 but as I look in the whole spectrum of, you know, options, um, Avalanche sounds like it makes a lot of intellectual sense. So first, I do want, I do want to touch on it, even though I'm not going to get probably the math, but at least like the analogy around, you know, the probabilistic kind of approach towards the three people and then expanding and how somehow that scales 
which is super clever and I can kind of make it out, but I can't do. So Kira, can you mind starting there with us for us? Let's start there. Let's start at the consensus protocol level. Okay. So here is, here's how the world starts. So what we want to do is we want to keep tabs on who's got which coins. That's the central task of every blockchain. This is what Bitcoin does. This is what Ethereum does. This is what everybody does. And so what we want to do is make sure that when Alice pays Bob, everybody records this. And if Alice is being evil and she's also trying to pay Bob and Charlie with the same coin, then we should pick only one of them. The network should tell one of them, you got paid, and it should turn and say to the other guy, you did not get paid. And everybody has to agree. So you don't have a situation where both Bob and Charlie happen to think that they got paid. This is the double spend problem. The central task of a, uh, of a, of a blockchain is to solve the double spend issues. Okay. So uh, how do we solve this? Well, we solve it kind of like this. So, uh, and I'll give you the full history of, uh, of this area. So I'll give you what everybody does. Well, there are only three different approaches to solving this problem. And I'll give you all three. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. So the, um, uh, the simplest thing we can do is we designate some people as the record keepers. We have a Senate, okay? A hundred of, uh, let's say a hundred people. And uh, what you do is when it's time for Alice to make a transaction, she goes to the Senate, she goes and tells people in the Senate, hey guys, I'm giving my coins, I, Alice, am giving my coins to Bob, record this. Now, if only one Senator records this, that's not sufficient because he could die. And then suddenly we have to, you know, the, 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 the fact gets lost. Um, she can't wait for all hundred of them to write this either because one could already be dead She'll never hear back from him. And so if she's waiting to hear from 100, it's going to take for a while. It turns out that uh, these systems require typically that Alice speak to 67% of the network. And then she gets back a response from them. And uh, even if some people die, there will be enough people to carry the message forward and, uh, and keep up the, uh, the fact that Bob now owns Alice's coins. So this is the protocol behind Ethereum 2, behind Corda, behind Polkadot, behind Cosmos, all of these protocols rely on this notion of a quorum intersection. And um, so if you look at it from the, the point of view of the senators, they want to record something if and only if uh, 67 of their colleagues have also recorded the same thing. So there's a lot of communication within that Senate. As a senator, your job is Okay, Alice is telling me this. I don't want to be the lone person to write this down. I want to make sure all my colleagues have it. So then I have to go talk to them or learn from them that they also heard this thing. And I only write it down when I know that 67 of them have heard it. So these protocols are the classical protocols that accomplish this. They typically require um, all of the senators to talk to each other. And so 100 people talking to another 100 people, that's 10,000 messages. That's barely doable. If you had a thousand people, then you'd have to have a million messages. And if you had 10,000, then you'd have to have a hundred million. And so suddenly the numbers start stacking up. So these protocols do not scale in the number of participants. The best protocol of this sort was designed by uh, someone named Ted Yin and his colleagues. He's the first author. Uh, Ted Yin is my PhD student. I sent him to the West Coast. He spent some time at VMware. He worked with people there. He came back and said, hey, I built something cool. And uh, that protocol is called Hot Stuff. And uh, it is now used by Facebook's Libra. So, um, so when Zuckerberg was being called upon uh, to testify about Libra, he was actually talking about, you know, underneath the covers, it, it was Ted's protocol. And uh, Ted came back that summer and said, yeah, I did this, it's cool. Um, but I want to work on something even cooler, and he's now working on Avalanche. So uh, I'll get to how Avalanche works in two seconds. So we knew about these systems. They work well when you have a small set of people keeping, keeping records, right? So if you've got Zuckerberg and his like 25 friends, then this is fine. 25 squared is not a very large number. You could handle it. But it doesn't, they don't scale. And um, so... And uh, uh, Satoshi knew about these protocols. These protocols are not, they're not new. They go back to the 70s, some of them. So Satoshi knew about them. And uh, his response was, well, look, this is all academic crap, okay? This, these systems never scale. They're not open. 
And uh, if you've got 25 people you, to participate, you have to convince all 25 of them to admit you. And so that's always going to be a small, closed universe. We will never be able to break in. And he wanted to build a permissionless system. So the way the Satoshi protocol works is kind of like this. Suppose um, you know, we're trying to make a decision. And um, uh, my analogy is kind of like, you know, let's suppose we're in a stadium. We have a large number of participants, right? We have you know, 100,000 participants in a giant stadium. And uh, we don't know who's in it. What Satoshi does is he distributes little lottery, lottery tickets. And uh, at some point in the game, some, one of the person uh, was one person holding one of those tickets is declared the winner. It's kind of like the kiss cam. You got lucky, the kiss cam focuses on you. And you're the, you're the king of the moment at that, at, at that instant. And when the camera focuses on you, you get to say, hey, I have this lottery ticket in my hand that's winning. So I just, I, I'm a miner who invented a block. I just discovered a block. And I will tell you all that I think Alice uh, paid Bob. That's how we're going to, that's the one we're going to pick and we're going to discard the other one. So that's the process by which Nakamoto consensus makes progress. You know, then the camera turns on to the next person and then they say, oh, by the way, Bob ended up paying that money to David and David paid it, paid it to Eve and so forth. So that's the, uh, the, the probabilistic nature of the Nakamoto consensus process where the miners are discovering blocks and tacking them on top of each other. And it's a very open process. Notice that I didn't have to know the names of people in the stadium. I didn't have to have a, an entrance step. You know, it was just very fluid. Anybody could just jump in with their winning ticket in their hands. Now I want to tell you how Avalanche works. It's a very simple protocol. It does the same silly, simple thing repeatedly. And uh, by the magic of the protocol, it turns out that in a very short period of time, it achieves consensus. Here is the simple thing. Suppose we're in a giant stadium and suppose we're going to make a decision, right? We want to decide between Alice is paying Bob or Alice is paying Charlie. It doesn't matter which one we pick, but we should pick only one and all of us should pick the same one. That's what we want to achieve. So uh, here is how Avalanche works. What, what each participant does in this giant stadium is they pick a small number of other people. So I ask like three people, yo, oh, you over there, you over here and you over there. Uh, what do you think? Alice paid Bob or Alice paid Char? And the response is coming. Can I just say red and blue? It's simpler, like red or blue. Say red or blue, which one do you prefer? And they say, well, I like red. You know, I heard it first. I like blue and I like red. And I say, okay, you know, I didn't have a preference to begin with. It looks like uh, other people are preferring red. So I will go with red. So I put my weight behind what I perceive from my sampled, uh, from my simple sample that uh, is, is the popular option. So it turns out that this is a highly unstable situation. This situation is unstable as long as there is a mix of colors. So if the stadium has reds and blues, um, people will suddenly put their weight behind what they perceive to be the, the, the predominant color. So imagine, like here, let me give you a, a starting point. Suppose the worst possible situation has happened. The, the stadium is half red, half blue. We do some sampling after one round, that stadium is not going to be 50-50. Just because of randomness, we're going to pick a little bit more red or a little bit more blue. And then the next round, well, we are more likely to go red if, we, if we're already 51% red. And so if we start out at 50-50, just by random variation, we'll get 51-49 in one direction or another, suppose it's red. And then the next round, we are more likely to go red and then even more likely to go red. And then suddenly we will find ourselves uh, essentially shedding off energy in the, in the system, shedding off entropy until we hit rock bottom. When the entire stadium is the same color, then we're stable. That's when it's, it's, it's incredibly stable. In fact, it's impossible to revert it. So we will cross a threshold, which we call the point of no return. And past the point of no return, I'll just be like, hey guys, what do you guys prefer? And they'll all be like, red, 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 red. And now we're red. That nobody, like God himself, couldn't come in and, and change it because the protocol is, I ask, and everybody else has already committed red, and now it's immutable and uh, finalized. So it turns out that even in a very, very ginormous stadium with hundreds of thousands of participants, this protocol uh, achieves finality in about 20 rounds, 15 to 20 rounds. 
So I just have to ask a couple of times, like about 15 times, maybe 20 times. And at the end, whatever color everybody likes is the color I pick. And uh, that's a fascinating result. It means that you can achieve consensus in a giant, giant sea of participants. You can have millions of people participate in this thing. You and I cannot participate in Bitcoin mining, but you and I can participate in Avalanche consensus protocol. And um, it turns out that decisions are super fast. So in Bitcoin, you have to wait for six blocks, six confirmations. Well, in Avalanche, uh, the finality is achieved in, in about a second. And uh, so you're muted. Sorry, I want to make sure I got you without my interruption. But no, I was going to say is that, so that was going to be my next question is, is that because you have to, like, you're, you're, doesn't it take longer? Like you think it, because you're, no, it doesn't. It's so it's way faster. Interesting. It's much mm -hmm. faster. Because and what is the magic? Because you said magic a few times. I mean, I'm not, again, a, a professor, but I did pay attention in, in probability class. Yeah. I, my professor said, I, I, I think I did well in it too, but curious, like what, is there some sort of like, like algorithm or something you guys came up with or what is it? Um, so there's an algorithm that, uh, uh, that we were experimenting with. And uh, this team called Team Rocket came up with, uh, with the Avalanche uh, protocol and its analysis. Mm. But uh, the magic is, uh, is exponential growth. So what mm. is happening here is uh, we are creating a, what, what is technically called a metastable system, a system that is in its normal initial state, it's unstable. And it's only stable in a, in a good desired state. This is mm. a very good property. <clears throat> the system is, by its nature, unable to stay in a bad intermediate state. It wants to make a decision. You give it something and it just wants to easily and quickly go to a state where it has committed that transaction to immutable memory. Interesting. And, um, and it does it exponentially fast. So I ask three people, they ask three people, those people ask three people, and suddenly you have this explosive ah. growth through the network. And hmm. uh, that's why in 15 to 20 uh, rounds, you can ass be assured that everybody has spoken to everybody multiple times and they are in lockstep uh, formation picking the same place. Okay. Yeah, cool. Okay. I'm starting, starting to come to come together a bit. Okay. <laughs> Continue. So it's very yeah, wow. It's very different from anything, uh, anything else that other people talk about. When people talk about their own consensus protocols, they are typically going back to the 90s. They are dusting off one of these old protocols for like 100 participants. And they're coming up with, uh, with schemes that are incredibly limited in, uh, in, in participation. Hey, they're not uh, you probably don't want to comment on other projects. I was just going to ask, like, do, you, do you have any thoughts around Solana? Just like, do you feel like that team is approaching it from a fundamentally very theoretical level? Or do you think that's also another one of those same old, same old? Uh, I like Solana, but deep mm. down, it's a classical consensus protocol. Mm. A bunch of things uh, that are... Um, uh, that are a little different. So one of the things they're doing is they are counting as a transaction every single one of the messages that the system uses to actually achieve consensus. Hmm. So their numbers are far higher than what they should be. Those are not useful transactions. They're just messages that all these people have to send to each other. That's one big problem with Solana is that their numbers are currently measured that in a unique fashion that's solely unique to Solana and no other coin. So that's a big red flag. I've spoken to Anatoly about this, that this is not the right way to measure things. Uh, the second thing about Solana is, um, as I said, it's a classical protocol. It is not going to scale to large numbers of participants. So hmm. as such, it's limited to a small number of people who are participating in the protocol. And, uh, and the third one is, I am not, uh, you know, I have some reservations about the, the, uh, the Byzantine fault tolerance of the underlying protocol. So, um, I, I, my reservations, I have had to soften down recently because I believe they made some advances. So, and I haven't looked at them very carefully. So um, I'm going to leave it at that. I need Interesting. To Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. Okay, cool. But, but back to, I guess, you know, so Avalanche, it sounds in, incredibly fascinating. So I guess, what are the repercussions of that? So because you have this like deep insight, or, you know, and you're incorporating this at a very, th is that part of what, what gives it its kind of super scalability and speed yeah. and low cost? Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. so it's, it's just, it's a completely different way of doing things. Nobody else does it this way. 
it is an entirely huge, big step in the science of consensus protocols. And what is its biggest criticism? Like, what, what are the people in your kind of, you know, world saying, well, have you thought of this, the women? Like, you just uh, don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll tell you the weakest, weakest thing about, uh, about Avalanche. The biggest mm. criticism, what it ought to be, mm. is that Avalanche is uncharted territory. Mm. It's not a well understood protocol. It's not like a something simple like you could pick up from 1990s and and you know build on. Um, and and uh, so what is the biggest worry about it? Well, we wrote a lot of code from scratch, and uh, that code is not as mature as Bitcoin. So we're going to have issues that Bitcoin uh, also had back when it was young, and uh, we actually had one of these about two weeks ago. Um, mm. There was a bug that caused the network to slow down immensely, and uh, it was a bug in cache management. It's a superficial bug. Once you discover it's happening, you fix it. The fix is not very hard at all. It's not a fundamental problem. But those kinds of bugs do happen. It's a young system. All of the code was written from scratch. And therefore, we are, we're, we're liable to have issues like this because we're such a new system. And um, you know, if people want something super tried and true, they should stick to Bitcoin. That's perfectly fine. Uh, mm. But if they want to take a chance on something that's technologically the most advanced, then I don't know of any address other than Avalanche that they should go to. We are by far the most innovative team with by far the coolest gadgetry under the covers uh, and the biggest advances. And, and, and is, I mean, I, I remember asking Vitalik this too, uh, really in the early days, but like in terms of, you know, the schedule and all that, is, is it like deflationary, disinflationary, or is it TBD? Like, oh, no, that's a good question. That's a very good question. And, uh, and we, I thought uh, uh, quite for quite a long time about this. Mm. Uh, as you know, eth Ethereum is, is, uh, has inflation in perpetuity. Right. His specific words to me were disinflationary, meaning it's not like this. It's not like this. It's like this. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think essentially what they have is like two percent emissions for all time. Yeah. And, um, and uh, in contrast, Bitcoin is deflationary. It's a hard capped asset. It's yeah. kind of like gold. And um, we ended up patterning after Bitcoin. Avalanche is hard capped. The hard cap is not going anywhere. There will only be at most 720 million avalanche. Got it. Boxes. Um, what can change an avalanche is hmm. governance, uh, after we introduce it, is the rate at which you're minting can change. So the limit is there, hmm. but you can say, hey, guys, these days we're minting too fast. Let's slow down. Or you can say, hey, guys, we are minting too slowly. We need mm. to incentivize people to participate in the system. Let's mint a little bit more. So the rate with which you mint can change over time with governance, but the limit that you're approaching is always going to be in place. Fascinating. Fascinating. Cool. Okay. And, and what, what have been some of the biggest challenges, like in terms of, uh, you know, this project, right? Uh, you know, from, from a technical perspective, like just get, like, I, I imagine going from, you know, you said you were a professor before, to go from, you know, I, I spent almost 10 years, by the way, working with professors. I used to be in robotics. Um, but going from a very theoretical kind of, you know, in your head kind of world to like the most real thing you could be building. <laughs> uh, but uh, was that, that must have been, that must have been not easy because <laughs> you have uncertainty now in your life. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy. On the other hand, I am delighted and I'm grateful that I have the best team in crypto. So I have so many superstars working with me that I am blessed. Um, so the biggest challenges so far, what have they been? Um, the biggest one, of course, is getting the word out, right? People, we're, we're a smaller project. People don't know us yet. And uh, so the techies who know about us, they all love it. And um, so that's a pretty good situation to be in. But we are kind of niche right now. And uh, people don't realize that, hey, this is fundamentally different. They had a huge technical breakthrough. They also changed the virtual machine model, they changed the network model. And so there's a lot of cool features underneath the covers in Avalanche, and it takes a while to get the word out. So to, to really even cover what the innovations are. Um, other challenges, you know, you also get to find out how messy the real world is, how messy the exchanges are, and uh, what their needs are and how to support them. That's, that's not easy. Um, exchanges are designed mostly for um, simple blockchains. And so if you have a Bitcoin-like blockchain, it ticks every 10 minutes, it's fairly slow. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's a linear blockchain. That's one thing. Um, Avalanche is super fast. 
and uh, it's 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 uh, building a graph. It's not building a not. It's it builds um, Ethereum like uh, regular chains, but it also builds a graph of decisions as well. So a graph is a very complicated thing, um, and so you know exchanges are not really geared up to handle these things. So we have to sort of. Do you know what DAG is? D A G. Yeah, DAG. Yeah, this is a directed acyclic graph. Yeah. Oh, is that is that what this is? We all, we build a DAG. Yeah, a DAG is a is a is a um, is a is a data structure. Hmm. So uh, if you if you're building, a like, have you heard of Conflux? Uh, sorry, because I mean that was one of my first interviews uh, that I did actually yeah, like uh, six Conflux months ago. Data. Yeah, I was fascinated by their approach, uh, and I th- I noticed some of the uh, Libra the like Libra guys had borrowed from from their project as well. But yeah. just curious, so so you so this is kind of like that in terms of. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, Avalanche has in it a whole lot of cool ideas. Uh, the DAG idea is not unique to Conflux. Yeah. Uh, IOTA also builds a DAG. I mean, DAGs yeah. are used anytime uh, you want, when, where you want um, essentially multiple tips that you can grow, right? So if you have a single blockchain like Bitcoin, it's actually going to be kind of difficult to grow it very fast. If you're growing it every 10 minutes, no big deal, right? But if you want to add blocks like every 100 milliseconds, then it's very difficult for me to, to wait and find out exactly when I can add, right? Because there's only one, I need to find the tip and then add to it. And getting to find where the tip is, is going to slow me down. Whereas if you have a giant graph, a directed acyclic graph, then you could be extending this portion of the graph while I could be extending this portion. And we will not get tangled up in the, and get in each other's hair. And we can make progress simultaneously on parallel tracks, if you will. And that's one of the many tricks we use to get the enormous performance that we get. We are the only chain I know of that doesn't uh, cheat in its numbers and achieves a a throughput that is three times higher than Visa. Let that sink in. That Visa on an an average day gets 1,700 transactions per second. Hmm. We get 4,500 transactions per second. I never thought I would see this day that somebody could say this, that they are faster than Visa on a decentralized platform. So these measurements were done on a network with I think 1,000 nodes, maybe 2,000, I might be wrong, but it's at least 1,000 nodes. So this is a real network, it's distributed. And, it's, and, uh, and I mean, it's, it's, like the network is new too, right? Like from what I understand, like when yeah. did you guys, when did it go live? Well, it went live only in September. So right. it's hmm. like five, five and a half months old, yeah. Fascinating. And then, and then post launch, like, could you have even predicted what your life would have looked like, but you know, pre launch in terms of like, I mean, because it's kind of like you said, unchartered territory upon unchartered territory. <laughs> it, it is. It was, it's been, a, it's been an amazing ride. So, uh, so you launch, you hold your breath, you hope for it to go well. And uh, after launch, we had a lot of activity. People love our features. They, For example, you can create new coins. So people have created a hell of a lot of coins. You can create NFTs and send them. So this is a thing for asset creation, right? People are creating new assets. Most of them are worthless. Most of them are for fun, but it's so cheap to use the network that they're doing it. And um, so that that's how it got started. And it was a lot of fun for, for, you know, it was initially Uh was fun. Yeah, I mean, I got to ask you a question. So I, yeah, just last night I was chatting with a buddy of mine who's a lawyer and uh, and another buddy of mine who's a bit of a, you know, Ethereum uh, fanboy. And we were chatting about, you know, uh, he's probably going to kill me for, for saying this, but whatever. Uh, putting copyright inside of a smart contract. So uh-huh. like when you have an NFT, now it's just some digital bytes, right? But he was like, Sonny, why doesn't somebody put, you know, the actual copyright, you know, the legal jargon inside of the contract so that it it potentially holds up in court as well? Is that, has that been done or is that something that could be done here? Um, you know it, what I'm saying or no? I do. Um, there have been a lot of attempts to, uh, to put credentials on, a, on blockchains. Hmm. So what he's referring to is, is a one kind of credential, a copyright notice or some kind of a thing and some kind of cryptographic thing that, that unlocks your ability to use another resource, hmm. a copyrighted resource. That's what we would call a credential. So um, the whole world, when they think about NFTs, they think about pretty pictures that move around, okay? That's the dumbest use of NFTs. And I love that use, by the way. Yeah. I love crypto kitties and I like sending pictures around and sending memes around. But the actual use case for NFTs is as credentials. 
So your lawyer friend is 1000% right. The right thing for me to do is for me to send you a credential in NFT form. It's like a card you carry. And when it's time to open the door, you should be able to take that NFT and use it as an authentication mechanism. Use it as a credential that allows you to get through the door. Maybe it's a metaphorical door that allows you to play a game. Maybe it's an actual door that allows you to step inside. Um, so this has been attempted before, um, but it hasn't been done very well, partly because you know on Ethereum, you could do things like this, but they're so expensive to use that you know, it's out of reach for most people. Um, on Avalanche, they're not. And on Avalanche, we have some solutions coming out that address the issue of blockchain identity. So your, your, uh, your license card should really be an NFT that's specific to you, that's private to you. And when it's time to show me it, you should be able to say, hey, you know, I'm Sunny right here, and here is my card, and, and prove whatever it is that you need to prove to me uh, and potentially maybe do it without revealing the entirety of the card to me as well. So there are lots of cute things that one could do with this. And then have you heard of Shift? Shift, no. Shift is a Shift with a Y. Shift.network is a site. Uh, Shift has a partnership with Binance mm -hmm. along with maybe 70% of the exchanges, at least Asian exchanges in terms of volume. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, they've built a network um, that, essentially, uh, that essentially addresses the travel rule you know the travel rule or no? Yeah, I do, I do, yeah. So it's essentially a network that, that addresses the travel rule, but it's a blockchain that they're using to do it with. Um, and, and, it's, and it's something like Ethereum. It's not Ethereum and it's not on top of Ethereum, but it's something that looks and smells like Ethereum. But these guys were, uh, I'm, you know, um, full disclosure, I'm, I'm involved with this project as well. But these guys were, when I told them I was talking to you, they're like, we should really talk to Edmund and, and figure out if Avalanche, it could be, uh, you know, an important piece here. So it'd be interesting to pick up the pieces there. Um, but, but just to go back, you know, okay, so we talked about your story, which I thought, you know, was super fascinating. We talked a lot of, or a little bit about Avalanche and the history behind it, post launch and the challenges. Was there anything else? Because um, I wanted to kind of shift gears as we get into the last bit here. But was there anything else you wanted to share about the project? And I don't know. I mean, you you made a call out, I guess, to you know maybe Fortune 500 companies and whatnot. Um, you know, I, I would love to also hear. You know, there are a lot of like I said, exchange owners that I am friends with and that are kind of in my network and people that have built Bitcoin exchanges and brokerages. Um, you know, okay, just yesterday, let's put it into context. Brian Armstrong told uh, Cheng CZ, I think you're a great CEO, like you're killing it, right? And CZ is kind of like uh, taking in the whole decentralized, right? He's got his own chain, he's doing this, he's doing that. It's a far different business model than the Coinbase. So what I'm trying to say is, is that entrepreneurs like myself who are looking at these two worlds are going, you know, like, like, for example, at Unocoin, we've raised money from Barry Silbert, and Tim Draper, and et cetera, et cetera. But we've always kind of, we don't, Unocoin is not a coin, it's not an asset, it's nothing, it's like a Coinbase type of solution since 2013. But what, what, where does, how do people like myself think about Avalanche in terms of solving big problems like the exchange problem, solving things like, like, you know, our main mission is what, fiat to crypto, obviously, right? Um, and we build our things on AWS and our centralized exchanges, et cetera, et cetera. But there is this movement towards kind of decentralizing, whether it's crypto to crypto exchange, like Uniswap, I think you mentioned. Or furthermore, something that I personally think a lot about is fiat to crypto. So think about local Bitcoins, but on a blockchain mm -hmm. or local Bitcoins meets an order book exchange like Wazirx, which was just acquired by Binance as well, on the blockchain. Do, right. Are you following me? So like, how do I, how does one kind of, if we look at all these tools as like tools in our toolbox, like, you know, it, it sounds to me that you have Turing completeness, you have speed, you have scale, you have all this flexibility at all the three layers. I think you have interoperability, all these things. So why would someone not look at you, or look at your avalanche as a potential, you know, um, platform to build these types of solutions on? Well, they do and they are looking. Um, so uh, we're new on the scene. So that's, that's uh, sort of the, the thing here. Um, but the people who hear about it are all very, very excited. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my view on this. So um, we are definitely going through a huge era of growth. There are lots of people with value in their hands. They don't know how to digitize it. Avalanche is here for them. Um, I, sh I should explicitly say a couple of things that we do. We have and support the entirety of the Ethereum virtual machine. 
everything Ethereum can do, you can do on Avalanche. And if, if it costs $500 uh, on Ethereum, it's going to cost about $15 at most on Avalanche. Okay, so it's supremely cheap compared to Ethereum because we have so much more capacity. So that's, that's the draw. And uh, we currently have, for example, a Uniswap clone on top of uh, Avalanche. That's much more democratic. The coin distribution is fair, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, but can you pause you just so, so when you say you have a Uniswap on yours, is it only a Uniswap for um, assets on Avalanche or is it Uniswap, Uniswap, meaning like I, you can trade literally any asset on, you know what I mean, on Ethereum against other Ethereum assets? It's, it's, it's better than the second option. Ah. So, uh, so let me tell you how so. You can trade any asset on it. It's called Pangolin. You can trade any asset on it. You can create an ERC-20 and trade it just like Uniswap, Uniswap. But you could also do the following thing. You could take your assets on Ethereum, move them over to Avalanche with the help of what we call a bridge. And once they're on Avalanche, then you could engage in Pangolin instead of engaging in Uniswap on Ethereum. So, uh, so this gives you a decentralized way to, uh, to get whatever it is that you want done and uh, to interact with smart contracts, to deploy smart contracts and so forth. Whatever you see on Ethereum works out of the box. It's bit by bit compatible on Avalanche and it works much more efficiently, much more cheaply. So it's a capital efficient network. We are not giving away the Avoxes to miners. If we're underneath the covers, there's no mining because it's a, it's a stake-based protocol. Uh, it's very, very fast, as I mentioned. The finality is super quick. So you submit a transaction and within a second, it's done. Like in the blink of an eye, it's committed, it's immutable. Nobody else can say this. Everybody else is going to have five second blocks, 15 second blocks and so forth. This is a super fast network. So um, that means that we're in a very good position. Evan, so did, I, did I hear you right as well that anybody can not mine, but stake, right? Obviously anybody yeah. can stake then, right? Okay, okay. interesting. Yeah, beautiful. It's, it's, mm -hmm. You just need 2,000 of Ox and you're off to the races and you can participate in the network. Beautiful. And uh, moving forward, uh, what, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the play here? Well, I think the play starts with, we need a blockchain networks. We need a blockchain that puts to rest all of these myths and misconceptions about how slow blockchains are and so on. So Avalanche is here. We, we unveil that. The next game here is going to be DEXs. DEXs today are terrible, right? So they're very slow to interact with. They don't give you good execution. They're very capital intensive. Um, you know, if you use one of these DEXs, you, the, you, there'll be enough price slippage. If you're doing a major, uh, a, a big move on any coin, then you're going to face uh, price slippage. So what we need are much better DEXs. So Brian, CZ, and Sam are killing it. So Sam uh, Beckman Freed, uh, Brian Armstrong, CZ, these are fantastic CEOs. I look up to them. They're doing a great job. They started on the exchange side and they're growing from there. Um, so I think Avalanche is an amazing platform and I have an amazing team and we know how to innovate not only at the consensus protocol layer, but also at every layer above. So wait, wait up and hold your breath a little bit and we will unveil some in interesting innovations in the DEX space that are just as big a step forward as Avalanche was in the blockchain space. Yeah, so that was gonna say on that note, yeah, keep me, keep me in the loop because uh, DEXs are something that I, I think a lot about. But you know, there's DEXs, which is like you said, Uniswap, yeah. but there, there's this kind of this, and a lot of people don't talk about it or know about it, but as you know, you know, um, regulations and banking are things that are real threats to our industry, right? And, and so um, in India, for example, two years ago, I don't know if you know, but um, the central bank uh, banned uh, banks from dealing with companies like ours. We challenged that in the Supreme Court and won. It was, you know, um, it was like the second time in history that the Supreme Court overruled the uh, central bank. Um, uh, but, but during that two year period, I mean, we were not able to serve our customers. It was very painful. Um, and I'm not saying we would do this, uh, but others, for example, like companies like Wazirx, who I've interviewed as well, they launched this very interesting and kind of hybrid model of like, 
local bitcoins meets an order book exchange. So the problem with local bitcoins is you'd have to, you know, you have to click a, like you have to talk to 20 different people, ratings, it's a bit of a mess. Yeah. But imagine if it was as easy as an order book exchange, you just click once and all your trades are done, you have to send your money to maybe five different people. Yeah. But things like that are, are oh, being right. built. And I think things like that should be built on top of a blockchain so that the whole world can kind of, you know, have access, right? Um, so, so, so it sounds like Avalanche might be a really good, or is probably a very good, you know, tool set for 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 entrepreneurs to be looking at. Absolutely, that mm -hmm. is definitely the kind of thing we have in mind as a use case. Crazy. We want we want Dexes to come on board. We want so Pangolin is the first Dex. It's the, it's an AMM. It's Uniswap like. Uh, but order book based ex exchanges are also fantastic, and I can't wait to see them uh, compete with the likes of Binance and Coinbase and so forth, because I want to see uh, the blockchain versions of these things that are centralized uh, exchanges. So once they're on the blockchain, you have transparency, you have protection from malfeasance on the exchange side. Uh, you might even get additional features like confidentiality if people do it right. So there are amazing features to be had here. Um, yeah. And the world just hasn't seen what is possible yet. Well, we're just beginning to, to scratch the surface. Well, I mean, we've always been hesitant because of the limitations you mentioned, right? Like, I mean, if it's going to cost $200, like, why are we going to, I mean, who are we really right. serving here? We're not serving we're anyone. On that platform. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think it's just becoming possible and we're seeing glimpses of it. And this is why I'm so so th grateful that, that you're able to spend some time with us here. Um. Okay, okay. So I have some, I have some other questions here that I got to get to. Okay, so number three, my third kind of big question, and I do have a couple more, uh, mainly because of your your involvement in AI prior to all this, but curious about okay, so the the the, the famous Peter Thiel question around contrarian belief, right? So, what is one thing that you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? And I think I kind of have an answer from our whole interview, but if you had to kind of bring it all home for for the listener, what is one thing that you know you believe to be true, having kind of seen this Bitcoin thing emerge now? You've been in it for quite some time. What is one thing that you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin would you know, disagree with you on? <laughs> so uh, that's an easy question, I think. Um, there are many, many things that I disagree with other people on, but, uh, but this one is probably something I disagree with every Bitcoiner on. And I love Bitcoin. Let me just mention this. Um, I did have slight uh, whatever it is. I had uh, misgivings around the time of the block size debate because I saw Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. But once you make the mental shift and you say Bitcoin is a store of value only, then everything follows. And, and so uh, I happen to love that system. The big front where I would disagree with every Bitcoiner is the following statement. The big fight in blockchains is over being money. The big goal is to replace the dollar or gold as a, as, as, as a, as a, as a store of value or as, a, as something with monetary financial value. So where I disagree with this is the, um, the, the singular nature of the task. That is, most Bitcoiners see as their goal uh, to build a system that's an alternative to the dollar-based or euro-based or whatever your currency is, um, that kind of a system. They, they, they see Bitcoin as an alternative to fiat and oil. Mm. And uh, I think there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. So Bitcoin should be that. But I don't think that's where the big fight is. So money is only the first step. This is actually, I'm actually quoting Satoshi, but most, most Bitcoiners don't know this. Um, so money is only the very first fight. The actual value in the world, the most value is not even in money. It's in mm -hmm. every other asset, corporate debt, stocks, options, financial derivatives, etc. There are trillions and trillions of, of, of instruments that carry value and yet you cannot get to them. I double dare you to try to buy some, I don't know, let's say state issued bonds from Russia. It'll be pretty much impossible. I double dare you to go and buy into, I don't know what I've mentioned, Toronto real estate. I don't know how to do this other than going to Toronto myself. It's very, very tough. Um, you know, so there are many other things I can name like this, but there are assets out there that are not accessible globally. And if we learned anything at all, like Bitcoiners should look at what they've got. They've got a wonderful thing. They can send it to anyone on earth. They can interact with anybody. They can trade it with anyone without permission. They can trace it. They can look at what's happening. They can build really cool crypto tools around it. Now take that and don't just fight with fiat all day. 
leave that aside. That fight is going to be fought and won, but also try to extend it to every other asset. And if you try to do that, then the system you will come up with is avalanche. And 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 I brought it up uh, briefly earlier, but why RSK isn't does not like from an intelligent kind of technical engineering hat perspective, like why does it not scale and solve the problems that we're looking for? Because it is Turing complete. It's yeah. on top of Bitcoin. You've got the like you said the 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 most important asset you know behind it, et cetera, et cetera. The so rootstock is a wonderful system. Um, mm. Damien Sergio Lerner is a fantastic uh, friend of mine. I've been in contact with him. I don't know, I've known him for seven years by now, hmm. maybe eight years, eight years by now, I think. He's a wonderful, wonderful fellow. And uh, RSK is a very nice system. RSK is a layer two system. And fundamentally, I am skeptical of layer twos. I built the world's fastest layer two for Bitcoin. So as the person who did that, I used special hardware for this. And that allowed us to be much faster than the likes of lightning. It's like lightning, but with hardware support. And so you can get far faster results. Liquid ish. Not liquid. Yeah, liquid tries to do something similar, but they are they are umpteen years behind us. They're maybe mm. three, four years behind us. So mm. three, four years ago, we built the world's fastest layer two for Bitcoin in a system called T-Chan, T-Chain. Mm. And um, so where do I want to go with this? Um, so I, I've experimented with these things. Layer hmm. twos are really great. So Ethereum people also, uh, they wanted to scale with ETH2. And I think they realized that that might be very, very hard to do. And instead they are now exploring rollups and other options that are also layer twos for Ethereum. I believe all of these are going to be, let's just say this nicely, uh, they're going to see limited success just like Lightning did. I, I cautioned everybody about Lightning. Lightning, there's nothing wrong with it, but there's nothing absolutely right with it either. Those systems are going to take forever to deploy. They will take forever to build the capacity that you need. And uh, fundamentally, the experience with them essentially is, is identical to a permission setup in the sense that it's very hard to find the layer two, uh, the, the hook-ins to layer two, that uh, allow you to interact with these systems. So the one thing that blockchain solve is the rendezvous problem. I, I don't need to, so if I need to send you some Bitcoin, I just need to find some Bitcoin node, or I mm. need to spin one up right here on my machine and I know I'm connected and I'm done. Mm. Well, layers, layer twos, don't, don't, you know, they don't address the rendezvous problem. If I wanted to go into a rootstock, whatever contract with you, I don't know how to locate you. I don't know how to connect. The bootstrapping is actually incredibly hard for any layer two. Um, for the same reasons, like Lightning, if I wanted to send you, you know, if, if I want to send you a Lightning payment, it would be a non-trivial thing for me to do right now. So layer twos are always going to be very difficult to deploy and will, in my view at least, always see limited, uh, limited adoption. And this has been borne out. Um, you know, we've had Lightning for many years now. And I called it out three, four years ago saying, this is fine, but it's not going to solve the scaling problem in the time frame that you think it will. And I have been 1000% right on this. It also has other problems like privacy, et cetera, et cetera, but I will leave those aside. Um, so I am not a big fan of, um, of, uh, of layer two solutions in general. I like lightning, but I don't, I don't think that it can, you know, it can, yeah, it's fine for limited uses, but I don't think it's going to be a retail success or a, or a consumer to consumer success, which it hasn't been. Um, I like rootstock, but I don't think anybody will really use it for contracts. Um, Ethereum rollup solutions are kind of nice. Some of them are nice, but I don't think that that's the way that programmers want to interact with a the blockchain. They want fast layer ones. That's what the world needs right now. Fascinating. We'll love that. Well, I love how I love, I mean, it's, I've been, like I said, I've been in this space since 2011. I've been doing events with thousands of people, all this stuff. And, uh, you know, I think, I think Bitcoin maximalists, they make a, they make the error of not being open-minded, you know? Yeah. And so to me, one thing I try and do is I try and understand the world around me at least, you know, and, and, and then make, you know, a calculated decision or whatever. So, okay. This has been super awesome. Um, I, I did want to ask you one or two more questions. So first of all, AI, uh, we don't have to spend too much time on it, but you did say that that was kind of your background. And it is one of the questions I like to ask near the end. Um, do these two worlds I mean, come together? Like meaning our blockchains and the avalanches as we're building these, 
And as someone who kind of spent time in there, how did they come together? And, and you know, Conflux, these guys, I talked to them, they're, they're actually very deep in AI as well, a lot of the team members. And, and I, I, just curious, like where, where, because there is this fear around, you know, two governments and five companies holding all of our data. Yeah. I, I, that gives me some pause. And so I wonder, is there a future where I can hold my own data and I get the benefits of AI? Sure. Um, great question. So for the longest time, I had this policy that if I received an email and it had the buzzword blockchain with the buzzword AI, I would just delete it. And there were so many people jumping into the, onto that bandwagon saying, hey, we're doing this and that. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> blockchain and AI. And most of those combinations have been completely broken bad ideas. Um, but let's see, there is a great world out there where mm -hmm. crypto gives us some cryptographic tools for privacy. And that suddenly, uh, changes and flips the script. So instead of having your data be held by Mark Zuckerberg and sold at whim, instead we can build systems where your data is private to you and you disclose portions of it on an as needed basis. So if you need to, you know, whatever, go to a website and they're trying to determine who you are, you don't have to tell them who you are. You just have to prove that you're, the, you're over the, the age limit, but you can do this without even disclosing your birth date. There are cryptographic tools for these kinds of things. You should own your, your data. You should definitely own your financial data. And uh, we have a long ways to go to get to the point where you can own all this data and selectively disclose it to other people and maybe selectively couple it with learning, uh, machine learning algorithms, such that people can extract value from this data without being able to identify you. There's a lot of great research that's being done on this frontier, but, uh, but it's still at the research stages. So I think in five years, we're going to start seeing actual solutions, three to five years, actual solutions to some of these problems. I would like to house my own data instead of trust somebody else to hold it. And I would like to allow people to run queries over it without disclosing the data to the person running the query. And uh, so if I'm applying for a credit card, people should be able to look at my financial history but they shouldn't be able to copy it and take it home with them and sell it to other people. So how do you do this? That's, that's a, a, a big challenge in this space. So um, I know that we have some ideas on how to do some of these things. And in our Skunk, Skunk Works program, we have some solutions that we've been working on hmm. for exactly this. So uh, in a year or two on Avalanche, you might even see some, some, uh, some prototypes at least uh, that address some of these challenges. These are big open questions. Nobody in the world knows how to, how to solve them. But whoever does, they're going to be at the very, very front line of a very, very fun, very, uh, very fast expanding frontier. Crazy. I love, uh, I love hearing that. Um, well, and, and this, this has been fascinating, man. Um, okay. So just before we, I guess, before I let you go, you know, first of all, any other, any other things you want to share, uh, you know, before you kind of maybe share the website or your Twitter handle and where people can kind of plug into your consciousness? Sure, of course. Um, so people can, can connect with us at avalabs.org uh, or avox.network. Both of them uh, will take them to a starting point that makes sense. If anybody wants to follow me on Twitter, my handle is Elite Haxor, and it's spelled funny. It's E L three three T H four X O R, and uh, you know, old school, uh, old school Elite Haxor here. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I am the farthest thing from from a maximalist. I'm not even an avalanche maximalist. May the best chains win. And um, what I think I am most proud of, Sunny. It is not the technical breakthrough. I spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about it. It is not my amazing team. I think the team is fantastic. Mm. Uh, or the other amazing teams that are building on top of Avalanche, which I'm very fond of. And I, I talk to them regularly and I happen to love them to bits as well. But uh, even them, they are not the thing that I'm most proud of. What I am most proud of is the community we have built. It's mm. a very science positive community. It's a very... Uh, I don't know, intellectually interested community, and they are here to build the next generation of systems. So if any of your listeners are here to experiment with something that's cheap, that is technologically exciting, that is quick to move, and has like-minded, smart, nice people behind it, then come and check us out. You will at least have some conversations that hopefully will be fun and, uh, and, and exciting for you as well, well as 
Yeah, well, you know, India's got a lot of programmers and we have 2 million users, I think, at Unicoin. So uh, we're going to try and, you know, hopefully encapsulate some of the, the core messages from this, this interview and, and get the word out and, and try and see if we can, you know, get some more eyes on your project. Uh, this has been super, super fascinating. You know, I, I, ah, man, I've been following you for a long time. So this has been exciting to finally get to connect. I, I mean, you know, I think that's all I got for you for the first one. If you or any of your team members or community members want to kind of, you know, do another session with me where we do maybe a couple months down the road or a month or two down the road. I would love that. Um, this is a project that has caught my attention. It takes a lot to catch my attention in this space because uh, most things smell funny. But this 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 is I don't know. Like I said, it sounds like you guys are going to the heart um, of of really what Satoshi brought to the world and questioning that you know with with math and and, and like engineering and 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 with the with the vision to change the world. So so thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, with that. I will, I mean, if there's nothing else on your side, I'll, I'll bring this one to an end. So just stick around for 10 seconds.